The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone to Nova 401k Associates webinar, Safe Harbor 401k Plans with Karen Daringhart and Lisa Rodriguez. Before we get started, I would like to point out the panel on the top right-hand corner of your screen. You will see a drop-down section for questions. This is where you will enter in any questions you may have for Karen and Lisa, and they will answer as many questions as time permits. Uh, please be sure to make your questions as descriptive as possible. If time runs out and you still have questions, please send them to our email address, webinars at nova401k.com. Right below questions, you will see the handouts uh, drop down. Here you will be able to download today's material. If you are with us today to earn continued education credit, please be sure to stay till the end to fill out our survey. This will allow us to track your time and participation. Certificates will be sent out within a week for those who met the time requirements. To view any webinars you may have missed and the recording of this session, you can follow us on our YouTube channel, which is NOVA401k Associates, or visit our website, which is www.nova401k.com backslash webinars. Thank you for joining us today. I would now like to introduce NOVA's Defined Contribution Administration Assistant Team Leaders, Karen Degenhart and Lisa Rodriguez. Go ahead, Karen. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, quick disclaimer before we begin. Um, this information, this the information in this presentation is general in nature and not intended to be a substitute for legal or tax advice. Please always consult a tax professional or a legal professional if you need legal or tax advice. Uh, Quick reminder on the Texas CPA credit. Um, for those of you out there who will be applying for CPA credit um, for this webinar, NOVA's provider number is 009820. You will need to register individually, be present for the entire webinar, complete an evaluation form, and then you will receive your certification within a week of this webinar. Um, so good afternoon. Um, I am so glad that all of you have decided to join us today for today's webinar on Safe Harbor Plans. Today's webinar is intended to be a basic overview of 401k plan Safe Harbor and is not comprehensive rules of all 401k regulations. What we talk about today is, an, is intended to help plan sponsors understand the testing requirements of a 401k plan and how a safe harbor plan design can help alleviate some of those testing requirements. Our hope is that when what you learn today will open up some dialogue among you, your plans advisor, and your NOVA account manager in possibly making plan design changes that can help you achieve better outcomes in terms of your retirement plans benefits. Today's webinar will cover an overview of common ERISA terms and acronyms, HCEs, understanding basic annual testing for 401k plans, a history of safe harbor plan design, the requirements to become a safe harbor plan, learning how to avoid operational problems, recognizing annual requirements to maintain a safe harbor 401k plan, and NOVA's cybersecurity measures. There are many different terms and acronyms used under ERISA. So before we start, let's be sure you have a good understanding of the most common ones. Um, let's start with ERISA. ERISA is the acronym for the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. ERISA is the federal law that sets the minimum standards for all qualified employer-sponsored retirement plans. 1K is the subsection of the U.S. Internal Revenue Code that allows 401k plans to operate on a tax-favored basis. Deferral, sometimes called a 401k deferral or an employee contribution, a deferral is a piece of compensation that an employee contributes, defers, into a 401k plan. It's called a deferral 
since the employee is placing compensation into account to be deferred until a later date, hopefully retirement. Traditional versus Roth. There are two types of deferrals, traditional deferral, which is not taxed in the year it's contributed to the plan and Roth deferral, which is taxed in the year it's contributed to the plan. Each type of deferral has different tax rules when contributed to the plan and then again when distributed from the plan. ADP ACP. ADP stands for Average Deferral Percentage. ACP stands for Average Contribution Percentage. We'll cover the ADP and ACP testing requirements further along in this webinar. HCE and HCE. HCE stands for Highly Compensated Employee. We will cover what a highly compensated employee is in detail on the next slide. NHCE stands for non-highly compensated employee. A key employee. A key employee is one who is an employee who owns more than 5% of the company, an employee who owns more than 1% of the company and has an annual compensation greater than $150,000, or an employee who is an officer of the company and has annual compensation greater than $200,000 in 2021. This compensation number is generally indexed each year, so it's always a good idea to verify each year with your plan's account manager. Now, when looking at ownership in 401k plans, you wanna remember that family attribution applies when determining key employees and HCE. So always be sure to let your plan's account manager know of family relationships. Top heavy. In terms of total plan assets, a plan is considered top heavy if the total of all key employees' account balances is greater than 60% of the total of all account balances in the plan. We will discuss top heavy in more detail further along in this webinar. Amendment. In order to be qualified, your plan must follow a legal plan document. Anytime you wanna change a term under the plan, whether it be eligibility, vesting, contribution types, or moving to a safe harbor plan design, a plan amendment is required in order to incorporate that change into your plan's legal document. Now, there's a saying that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. When dealing with your company's re qualified retirement plan, that's usually not the case. Always be sure to check with your account manager before making the change to your plan or before making any changes to your plan's procedures. The highly compensated employee, the HCE. The HCE is an important step in plan testing and deciding on safe harbor. And it's an area where we see our clients trip up quite a bit. So I'd like to go a little bit deeper on this topic. An HCE is an owner that owns more than 5% of the company in the current plan year or the previous plan year. So for 2021, an HCE is going to be anyone who owned more than 5% of the company in either 2021 or 2022. An employee with compensation, um, an HCE is also an employee with compensation in excess of an annual IRS limit. So any employee, owner or not, who had more than $135,000 in compensation in 2021 is considered an HCE for 2022. This compensation limit is generally indexed each year by IRS, so always check with your plan's account manager to identify who your HCEs may be each year. Also, remember that ownership attributes to certain family members of direct owners that are working for the company, and this can include parents, children, spouses, and grandchildren. So again, that's why it's vital to make sure that your account manager is always aware of family relationships within your company. Annual testing is how we determine that a company's HCE, those highly compensated employees, 
are not benefiting from the plan too much more than the company's other non-highly compensated employees. This is why you will hear this testing referred to as annual non-discrimination testing. It's designed to be sure the benefits under the plan are not discriminant in favor of the HCEs or owners of the company. We do this by administering a number of different non-discrimination tests on the plan each year. The ADP, ACP, and top-heavy testing will both be covered in more detail on the next slides. For 410V coverage testing, each year your plan needs to be tested to ensure it's not set up in a way that benefits your company's HCEs excessively more than its non-HCEs. Coverage testing doesn't really care how much is being contributed to the, but rather who is eligible to get those contributions each year. For example, if you had a plan where all of your HCEs were allowed to participate, but only a fraction of your NHCEs were allowed to participate, the plan might not pass covering, coverage testing in that scenario. Um, 14S compensation ratio testing is used when you want to exclude any type of W-2 compensation from a plan contribution, such as bonus pay, cell phone allowances, or commissions. Additional testing must, must be done to be sure these exclusions are not discriminant, again, in favor of the HCEs or owners of the company. Why might a plan's compensation ratio test fail? Say your plan excludes cell phone allowances from all plan contributions, but only non-highly compensated employees receive this type of cell phone allowance pay. So when we do the compensation ratio testing, 100% of your highly compensated employees W-2 compensation is being covered by the plan, but only 80% of your non-highly compensated employees W-2 compensation is being covered. This is considered discriminatory, and the 414 testing would likely fail. So before you decide to exclude any type of W-2 compensation from your plan, you wanna be sure to one, make sure it's allowable for the plan document, and two, discuss with your account manager to be sure it won't cause any testing failures. Now it's because of these tests that your annual census data, that annual questionnaire that we send every year, and those family relationships are so important to the plan. If that data is correct, your testing will be correct. And an incorrect test can have a multitude of consequences. Guys, I know that the annual data upload and questionnaire are time consuming, but we need this data and info in order to get your testing right. So remember in January, February, before you hit that send button on your annual data, just check it over to make sure it's correct. Now let's talk about the plan's ADP testing. The ADP testing or average deferral percentage test demonstrates that the plan doesn't discriminate in favor of the highly compensated employees, those HCEs, with regard to employee deferral rates of contribution. Again, those deferrals are what the employees contribute to the plan from their paychecks. Generally, if the deferral average of all the HCEs under the plan, those highly compensated employees, generally their deferral average cannot be more than 2% of the deferral average of all the non-highly compensated employees under the plan. Failing the ADP test requires, requires coverage corrective action. Um, and this can be done in two ways. One, by giving refunds to some or all of your HCEs, this is the most common method of correction. And the other method is by giving additional contributions to some or all non-highly compensated employees. Now this correction method can be expensive. Each year when NOVA does your plan's testing, your account manager will let you know if the plan failed ADP testing and also what type of correction is necessary. Quick example, let's look at a quick example of ADP testing. 
In this scenario, we have four non-highly compensated employees eligible to defer under the plan. Their average combined deferral percentage for the year is 4.25%. You will see that even the, even the eligible employee who chose not to defer is including in this test. If an employee is eligible, they're including, no matter how much or how little they deferred during the year. Now, as you recall from the last slide, the HCE's average must be within 2% of the non-HCE's average. The non-HCE average in this example is 4.25%. 4.25% plus 2% allows for a maximum ADP for the HCE group of 6.25%. So you can see this test fails. Since the HCE group, those highly compensated employees, they're deferring an average of 9.5%, which is greater than the permitted 6.25% based on the non-highly compensated deferral average for the year. Corrective action is required that will either bring the HCE deferral down to 6.25% by refunding some deferrals to those HCEs or by bringing up the non-HCE average by giving those employees additional contributions that would be funded by the employer, you. Again, each year when NOVA does your plan's testing, your account manager will let you know if the plan failed ADP testing and what type of corrective, corrective action is necessary. We do look at both correction methods and we will let you know which is the most economical. ACP testing, or the average contribution percentage testing. This test demonstrates that the plan does not discriminate in favor of the highly compensated employees with regard to employer match rates of contribution. The ADP testing and correction methods are done in the same manner as the ADP testing. However, with ACP testing, we're looking at the employer match rates for each eligible employee, as opposed to the employee deferral rates. Top-heavy testing. In general, a plan is considered top-heavy if the total of all key employees' account balances is greater than 6% of the total of all account balances in the plan. This calculation is called the top-heavy ratio. When a plan is top-heavy, it's subject to top-heavy minimum contributions, which are required employer contributions that must be made to all non-key employees who are employed at year-end. This required employer contribution is generally 3% of the employee's total compensation for the year. With top-heavy, an employer contribution is always required. Top heavy cannot be solved by issuing refunds to HCEs or key employees. It can only be solved by contributing additional funds to those non-key employees. So that was a quick, really quick overview of basic 401k plan annual testing requirements. Um, so now we can talk about how a plan can reduce the impact of some of these annual testing requirements on your plan each year. In 1996, the Small Business Jobs Protection Act provided a safe harbor plan design. A safe harbor plan requires that all eligible employees receive a minimum guaranteed employer contribution each year. And in return, the plan is deemed to pass certain non-discrimination testing for the year. Then in 2006, the Pension Protection Act, the PPA, added an additional safe harbor um, plan design called automatic enrollment. Um, well, automatic enrollment, they gave automatic enrollment a qualified option to make it safe harbor. Um, and this additional option is called a QACA, or a Qualified Automatic Contribution Arrangement. Safe Harbor plans are 
deemed to pass the ADP and ACP testing each year. So there's no more worrying about HCE averages staying within 2% of the non-HCE averages. Um, in most cases, a safe harbor plan design will satisfy a plan's top heavy requirements. And a safe harbor plan design will allow your HCEs, your highly compensated employee, employees and your owners to contribute the annual IRS maximum deferral each year without, again, having to worry about staying within 2% of the average deferral of the non-highly compensated employees. A safe harbor plan design does not automatically satisfy coverage testing. However, the inherent requirements of a safe harbor plan design will generally cause coverage um, to pass annually. And safe harbor cannot satisfy any 414S compensation ratio testing. So again, if you want to have any, um, if you're thinking about excluding any type of compensation from your qualified plan, you do want to make sure that you discuss this with your account manager beforehand. Now to make this no testing deal with the IRS, safe harbor plans do have a few requirements. The first of which is a required employer contribution. And this contribution can be either a match or a qualified non-elective contribution, also called a QNAP. Safe harbor plans must have an annual notice requirement, which needs to be provided 30 days before the first day of the plan year and must specify both the safe harbor plan election for the year and the safe harbor contribution formula. Now, the SECURE Act eliminated the notice requirement for a safe harbor QNET plan design, but safe harbor matching plans are still required to provide notice each year. Safe harbor contributions do have to be 100% vested. However, for the Qualified Automatic Contribution Safe Harbor, the QUACA, a plan may have a two-year cliff vesting schedule. The Safe Harbor contributions also have some withdrawal restrictions. Um, safe Harbor contributions cannot be distributed from the plan until termination of employment, retirement, or if allowed under the plan, in case of IRS defined hardships or in-service distributions at age eight, at age 59 and a half. Mid-year amendments to safe harbor plans are limited. If you have a safe harbor plan design and are contemplating making a change to any other term of your plan, be sure to discuss with your account manager to see if the change you wanna make is allowed mid-year or if you must wait until the first day of the next plan year to make that change. 401k plans may convert to a safe harbor match plan design only on the first day of the next plan year, unless it's a new plan or a profit share only plan that is adding a 401k feature. So if you're a non-safe harbor plan now, you can't convert to a safe harbor match plan design until January 1st, 2023 at the earliest. But Thanks to the SECURE Act, plans may now switch to a safe harbor non-elective contribution, a QNEC safe harbor plan design prior to the 30th day before the end of the plan year. Alternatively, if the amendment provides for a higher non-elective contribution for the plan year, the amendment can actually be made any time prior to the last day of the following plan year. So you would have until 1231, 2023 to decide to do an enhanced QNEC safe harbor plan for 2022. Um, so this means if you're sitting out there without a current safe harbor plan design, you do still have the opportunity to be safe harbor for 2022. I am going to turn this presentation over to Lisa now, and she is going to talk to you about safe harbor options. Thanks, Karen. Let me see if I can get this presentation going. Let me know if you can see my screen. 
I can see your screen. I'm trying to figure out how to turn my camera off. <laughs> I'll turn off your camera for you, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> How do you get in a presentation mode? If you go up, there's a little a projector screen with the triangle on it. There you go. I want, oh, OK. And you want to go to display settings and swap your screen. There you go. Okay, awesome. Now let me get to the right screen. We'll be on slide 16. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so the next couple of slides, we're going to go over a couple of options that you have in regards to safe harbor plan, uh, different types of formula. You pretty much have at least three options that you can select from. So the first option that we're actually going to start with is with the safe harbor match. Under this option, you can either select to be, you can select to use a basic safe harbor formula or you can select to use the enhanced match formula. The formula for the actual basic match is to match 100% of the first 3% of the employee contribution plus 50% on the next 2%. That's the basic uh, match formula. Or you can select to use the enhanced match formula, which is match 100% of deferrals up to 6% of compensation. If you match anything above 6%, you have, we pretty much have to test the plan. It's subject to be testing if you go anything above the 6%. So typically what I've seen uh, clients do if they like the enhanced match is that they either select 100% up to the first 6% compensation, um, I've sometimes seen where they select 100% up to 5% of compensation or even 100% up to 4% of compensation. Um, those are our common enhanced match formulas that I've seen out there. Under this option, only employees who actually contribute into the plan will actually receive the safe harbor match. Um, the safe harbor match option is uh, considered to be one of the preferred methods when no additional employer contributions are intended by the employer for that particular plan year, or if they don't, or if they intend not to be making any other type of employer contributions, then you know for the upcoming years, then that would be a perfect example of maybe uh, becoming safe harbor and using that safe harbor match formula. Okay. So the second option that you can select from is the safe harbor non-elective formula. In this option, you have to contribute at least 3% of compensation. Your employees do not have to contribute into the plan to actually receive a safe harbor non-elective contribution. Um, if owners are planning on making a profit sharing contribution, they may want to consider electing the safe harbor non-elective option as it will allow them to pretty much max out for the year. Um, the safe harbor adoption can also be allowed mid-year. And I think uh, Karen actually mentioned that. Uh, in one of the earlier slides. So this option, you can actually select mid-year to become a safe harbor. Okay, so what allowed us to do that? Uh, it was the passing of the actually Secure Act of 2020 that allowed for the mid-year adoption to the safe harbor uh, option, which means that plans can now be amended up to 30 days before the end of the current plan year to be safe harbor for that year. This only applies to the safe harbor non-elective options 
the Safe Harbor Max cannot be adopted mid-year. Okay, so now let's go over this example. In mid-2022, NOVA prepares a mid-year test for your plan. The mid-year test fails, and large refunds are projected for highly compensated employees. You have up until December 1st of 2022 to amend your plan to become safe harbor non-elected for the 2022 plan year. All the eligible employees will receive a contribution of 3% of compensation for the plan year, and the plan will no longer need refunds, and the ADP and ACP tests will be deemed to pass. Okay, so the passing, the passing of the SECURE Act also allowed for late mid-year adoptions of the safe harbor non-elective contribution. This means that plans that plans can also be amended up to December 31st of the following plan year to be a safe harbor for the previous year. Again, this only applies for the safe harbor option. The safe harbor max cannot be amended mid-year. Okay, so here's the example for this particular situation. Let's say in January of 2023, NOVA prepares your annual compliance testing. The testing fails and large refunds are now due to your highly compensated employees. You now have up to December 31st of 2023 to amend your plan and become a safe harbor non-elective for the 2022 plan year. All the eligible employees will receive a contribution of 4% of compensation for the 2022 plan year, and the plan will no longer need refunds. The ADP test, along with the ACP test, will be deemed to pass, will be deemed to pass for the year. Okay, so the third option would be a QUACA safe harbor formula. Under this option, you can either elect a 3% non-elective contribution to all eligible employees, or you can elect a tiered match contribution equal to 3.5% of compensation, and that's only if the participant defers at least 6% of their comp. Um, the tiered, the actual tiered match formula in this situation would be match 100% up, up to the first 1% of compensation, and then match 50% of the up to 6% of the next uh, percent of compensation. So it can be a little tricky um, in calculating this this uh, quacka contribution. So if you ever, if you decide to go with this option, definitely get with your account manager. They can definitely help you calculate that contribution for you. Okay, so let's go over a couple of examples. So in this first example, we're gonna go over the basic safe harbor match uh, formula. Okay, so let's say an employee has compensation equal to $50,000. They're deferring $4,000 for the year or 8% of their compensation. The basic match formula in this example would be 100% of the first 3% deferred and then 50% on the next 2% deferred. Let me see if I can switch this over. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, so technically what you would do is first you would take uh, the first tier, which is match 100% of the first 3% defer, equal to would equal to 1,500. So in order to do that, you pretty much take 50,000 times 3%, and you'll end up getting 1,500. The next step would be to match 50% on the next 2% deferred. Um, usually, you can take that. You can take the 50,000, multiply it by 2%, and you'll end up getting like $1,000 then you'll divide it by 50, and then you'll get $500. So if you add the 1,500 and the $500, 
the total match in this example would be $2,000 that the employee would get. Okay, so in this example, we'll cover the enhanced match formula. Um, let's say an employee has compensation. Let's just keep it the same as we did in the prior example. Employee has compensation of 50000 They are deferring 4000 or 6% of their comp. Uh, sorry, I think it says basic match formula, but it should say enhanced match formula. So the formula would be match 100% on the first 6% of pay that they defer based on the information provided, 100% of the first 6% deferred would equal to $3,000. Uh, you'll take the 50,000 times 6% to get $3,000. So this employee would get a $3,000 uh, match contribution. In this third example, we're gonna go over the safe harbor non-elective uh, option or formula, I should say. Um, an employee has compensation of 50000 They have elected not to defer into the plan, so it's 0%. Um, the safe harbor non-elective contribution formula is 3% of compensation, regardless if they're deferring or contributing into the plan. 3% of their compensation in this example would be 1500 so that's 50,000 times 3% will get you 1,500. So the total contribution for this employee would be uh, 1,500 that they would get as a safe harbor non-elective contribution. Okay, so now let's go over the vesting requirements for safe harbor plans. So the safe harbor match and the safe harbor non-elective contributions must be 100% vested at all times. Uh, the QUACA, on the other hand, uh, can be we can delay the vesting until year two. So what does that mean? That means that anything under two years would be vested at 0%. Once they reach year two, two years of service, they would have 100% vested in their QUACA contribution. Uh, three, uh, all other employer contributions under the plan are subject to their regular vesting schedule. If you're not familiar with the vesting schedule for like, let's just say the profit sharing contribution or if they're doing like a discretionary match, uh, check the plan document. That should state what vesting schedule your plan is currently using. Okay, so the QUACA has certain requirements uh, you need to be aware of if you elect this option for, for, one, for your safe harbor plan. So first, uh, it, it does have to be an auto enrollment feature within uh, the QUACA. It has to be a minimum default percentage of 3% and a maximum of 15%. Second, is that auto escalation will be required. If the defaulted rate is less than the 6%, then auto enrolled participants must be auto escalated each year until they have reached at least 6%. Now the employer does have the option to elect to continue to auto escalate uh, until a maximum of 15%. This is optional and it's not a requirement, but uh, there's some employers that would like to continue to do the auto escalation even after they have reached the 6%. So if, if one thing that I do want to mention is that if you do like the QUACA formula and you want to proceed with it, is make sure that your vendor can accommodate auto escalation. There's some vendors that, that can easily help you make things easier by helping you with the auto escalation each year. So definitely check with your vendor if uh, you're interested in this QUACA formula. Okay, so now let's go over the withdrawal restrictions for safe harbor contributions. Um, two that uh, are that usually come up are the following two. 
first you have to be age 59 and a half to actually take a withdrawal or you have to be a terminated employee in order to take a withdrawal from the 401k plan. Second, if, if participants have been defaulted, uh, have been defaulted enrolled in the QUACA, uh, then they can take what we call a permissible withdrawal of their automatic contributions within the first 90 days of being auto enrolled. This is the only time they can actually withdraw their money. Anything beyond the 90 days, they will not be allowed to take their money out of the plan. Okay, next is the annual notification requirement. The safe harbor status is a year-to-year year year election, meaning that a notice is required to be provided to all the eligible participants at least 30 days and not no more than 90 days prior to the beginning of each safe harbor plan year. For those new eligible employees that come in throughout the year, they must notify no later than their date of eligibility and no earlier than 90 days before actually becoming eligible. So the safe harbor notice is, is only required for the safe harbor match. Um, the safe harbor non-elective is no longer required to have a notice, but it's totally fine if as an employer you want to continue to provide that notice to your staff. It has very you know useful information and good information within that notice. So if you're a safe harbor knowledge, that feel free to continue to provide that notice to, to the staff. Okay, so you, um, you may be asking what's in that notice. So here's a couple of items that are actually included within, the, within that uh, safe harbor notice. First, the notice should actually include the safe harbor formula. Whatever type of formula you're using, make sure that the notice includes uh, the formula, it can be the basic safe harbor match, the enhanced, or the quacka. Uh, the notice should also include the employee contribution limit for the year, uh, any other discre the discretionary employer contributions that the plan allows, those items, so those contribution types will be included. The plan name to which the contributions are being made to, is included as well. The plan's compensation definition is on is in the notice. Um, the withdrawal provisions under the plan are included in the notice. The vesting is also included, and it's included for all the source types. So any type of contribution that is allowed under the plan, those will be listed on the notice, and it would include the vesting associated with that source. Uh, we also uh, make sure, because NOVA, NOVA actually generates the notice for you and then provides it to you so you can distribute. So the plan sponsor contact information is another item that's actually included within the notice. So in case the participants have questions, they can easily know who, who to contact within your company. Okay, so now let's go over uh, avoiding operational problems. So there's been a couple of uh, problems that we have seen, and I just uh, picked up, you know, three that we have seen come up. So the first one is safe harbor matching contributions. They need to be limited to the they need to be limited to the annual compensation cap of 305,000 for 2022. Now this cap changes. So for 2022, if there's anybody contributing in excess of, you know, 305, make sure you cap them at 305,000 for 2022. Two, the safe harbor contributions must be deposited to the correct source type. Uh, we've seen errors where they're being deposited to the wrong type uh, at the investment company. And three, do not match the catch-up contributions separately from the regular employee deferral contribution. Um, it'll give you a different calculation. So make sure that you don't calculate that contribution separately. Okay, so going back to 
to the very first um, problem is uh, the IRS compensation limit. So the annual compensation limit for 2022, as I mentioned, is 305,000. This is an IRS limit and may be changed from year to year. NOVA, um, NOVA will inform you of the new IRS limits in the fourth quarter of each calendar year. Why the fourth quarter? Because that's usually when the limits come out. So as soon as uh, they actually become available to us, then we'll pass that information along to you so you can be aware of the upcoming limits for the upcoming year. Okay, so let's go over a compensation limit example. Let's say Acme 401k plan has a dollar for dollar safe harbor match of the first 4% contributed by employees. The, this means that the maximum match any one participant can receive for the 2022 plan year is $12,200. And you'll determine that amount by taking 305,000, multiplying it by 0.04% to get 12,200. So any safe harbor match contributions over 12,200 will be forfeited along with any earnings or losses associated with that. Something important to note is that the annual compensation limit applies to the non-safe harbor contributions as well. Okay, so the second problem I had mentioned is depositing the safe harbor contributions into the wrong uh, source. With that being said, um, 401k plans are legally required to separately account for different contribution types. Um, that's the reason why it's very important that whenever you're making that deposit into the investment company is that you select the right type of contribution source when making that, that upload, uh, simply because distribution options differ from source to source. Um, the vesting is also different for each source. So here's a couple of contributions that are typically allowed within 401k plans. So the employee source, for example, that is always 100% vested. The Roth, same thing, always 100% vested. Now, when it changes is if, if the plan allows for non-safe harbor match and profit sharing, those have a vesting schedule tied to it. Uh, if you're not familiar with the vesting schedule, make sure you check the plan document as it will provide you the type of vesting schedule that the plan allows for those two contribution types. And, and of course, the, the safe harbor contributions uh, other than the quacka, of course, is 100% vested. Quacka is 100% vested in year two. So that's, that's some of good reasons. That's why it's very important that when you make that deposit, you deposit it into the correct uh, source type. Okay, uh, third problem is re regarding the catch-up contribution. Um, as a reminder, make sure to add catch-up and not catch up employee contributions together in determining the employee's deferral rate and in determining the safe harbor matching contribution. Um, same thing would apply with the employee Roth, Roth versus non-Roth employee contribution. Um, you would add both of them together to determine what the contribution would be. Um, okay, so so if you do have an incorrect match calculation that you cost, just make sure that you get in contact with your payroll provider, provider or internal payroll person to try to fix that problem. If you don't have a problem yet, just make sure that, you know, year, especially at the beginning of the year, because the limits change, make sure that you're actually calculating that match correctly. So make sure you get with your provider or your internal person to make sure that the proper steps are taking place to either avoid it or correct it. Um, the tiered safe harbor match formula is very common, but can sometimes be calculated incorrectly. 
feel free to get with your account manager if you're having issues on how to calculate the contribution, especially if you're doing it internally and don't have a provider that's helping you with that. Uh, I believe we may have some sort of spreadsheet that maybe your account manager can forward it to you that will help you calculate that safe harbor match formula. Okay, so you may be asking, is safe harbor plan right for you and the company? Uh, if any of the following actually apply, then you may want to consider uh, going with the safe harbor plan. So one, do you often fail the ADP and ACP discrimination testing that results in your highly compensated employee needing a refund? Two, do you actually have low participation rates from your non-highly compensated employees? Um, three, um, is the plan top heavy? That's another reason why you may want to consider going safe harbor. Uh, four, do you want to bring key employees to the IRS maximum limit for the year? And for, in this case, the, the maximum limit currently is 61,000. Um, the safe harbor plan will definitely give you the opportunity for all your key employees to get up to their maximum without having to worry about refunds. And then five, are you? Are already providing, oh, are you already providing employer contributions? For example, are you already doing like a, maybe a discretionary match, maybe a, a profit sharing? Uh, you can continue to do an employer contribution. It may be the case that maybe it will now be considered a safe harbor match or a safe harbor non-elective, depending on the type of contribution that you elect. Um, but it will allow you to automatically be deemed to pass the ADP, ACP test, and your key employees and AC employees can contribute the maximum for the year without having to worry about refunds. So, and then six, if, if the company has good steady cash flow and you want to, you know, reward your employees with a contribution, then you can, that's definitely a good reason, you know, to go safe harbor. Okay. So common, some common top heavy organizations that should probably consider maybe being safe harbor plan, a safe harbor plan is one of the following. Uh, owner operated businesses, any businesses that are ran, family ran, any uh, medical or legal practices often usually go safe harbor as well. Uh, any small companies with few highly paid owners and a small number of low-wage staff members uh, should probably consider going safe harbor. It will definitely allow them to maximize for the year without having to worry about refunds. Uh, groups with any with low non-highly compensation participation, so any low participation that you have within your company and as an owner, or key employee want to contribute the maximum, the safe harbor option will definitely allow you to do that. So that's something to consider. Okay, so after going through the whole presentation, if you still have questions, definitely feel free to reach out to your contact manager. Uh, but if you're ready to proceed with the safe harbor contribution option for the 2023 plan year, uh, contact your account manager at least by November 5th as the document does need to be amended by December 1st of 2022. Uh, we do have to you know, generate the notice for you and that notice does have to be distributed to participants by December 1st, 2022. You also want to make sure that you give participants the option of maybe changing their elections for new participants, maybe giving them the option of electing uh, a new election for the year if they're eligible. Um, you have to make sure that you notify the record keeper. They have to set, it, set up the safe harbor contribution source or bucket. Um, that way it can be ready for the upcoming year. And, and it does take time, so we definitely want to make sure that 
we get all this information at least by November 5th so we can prepare the plan going safe harbor for the 2023 plan year. Um, and lastly is that you also will need to notify your payroll department of the change. So for example, if you're doing it internally, you're going to have to take uh, steps into calculating the contribution, making changes for the upcoming year. Uh, and if you're using an outside provider, you would have to notify them, especially if they can help calculate that contribution for you. Okay, so at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Karen for the cyber security measures. All right, real quick, um, I know we're almost right at the top of the hour. Um, let's just take a few minutes to review a little cybersecurity. Um, okay. Um, cybersecurity threats, they're everywhere. So never send sensitive data via email without encryption. This includes census files, deferral files, payroll files, and address files. It also includes your ADP, ACP, top heading 410B, 410S testing. Um, that is why when Nova sends your testing packages, we always link those to plan sponsor link and we do not email those to you directly. Um, distribution and loan forms, those generally have employee social security numbers on them, employee addresses, and employee dates of birth. So we wanna make sure that we're not sending those via email. And then also tax forms, W-2s, K-1s, and Schedule Cs. To, uh, those of you that are clients of NOVA, um, you know, be sure to take, care, take, take advantage of our secure web portal on Plan Sponsor Link. This secure website includes a secure file exchange feature that allows for secure transmission of data from you to us and us to you. It also holds all of your important plan files to include documents and policies and testing packages. In addition to plan sponsor link, NOVA does take additional steps to secure your data, which would include um, encryption software on all of our email. Um, we do, um, we do, require that a current authorized plan contact reach out to the to us before we add a new plan contact to your plan so you know one of your employees can't call up and just say hey can i be added to access this plan um, we're not going to do that without your permission all nova employees are required to attend mandatory cybersecurity training every quarter and all passwords held by nova employees are changed at least every 90 days um, I want to thank you very much for attending our Safe Harbor webinar today. Um, I know there's a couple extra questions in here, um, and um, you know we'll, we'll, we'll give us your our, yeah we'll give you our contact information at the end. Um, just a quick reminder on the Texas CPA credits: make sure you complete the evaluation form take the survey and you will get your certification within about a week. Um, any questions after today, please contact your account manager if you're already a NOVA client. If you are not, um, you can go ahead and call or email Lisa or myself directly. Um, and please register for future NOVA, NOVA webinars at nova401k.com slash webinars. Thanks again. Alrighty, perfect. Thank you, Karen. Uh, just like Karen said, just a reminder to fill out the survey at the end of this webinar so that we may track who will be needing a certificate. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and reach out to Karen or Lisa, or you can email us at webinars at noah401k.com and we can forward those email questions to them. Uh, to view any webinars you may have missed and the recording of this session, you can follow us on our YouTube channel which is Nova401k Associates, or visit our website, which is www.nova401k.com backslash webinars. Thank you, Karen and Lisa, for your time today. And thanks again to everyone for joining. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.